Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Salem Center uh, event. I'm Greg Salmieri, a senior scholar at the Center, and I'm very happy to be able to uh, bring to us today and bring to campus um, an old friend of mine who's become one of the most uh, interesting writers on the subject of progress uh, in the world today. I'm one of the leading lights on the subject. Uh, this is Jason Crawford, uh, who writes The Roots of Progress, which began as a, a blog and a few years ago, and a really fantastic blog I encourage everyone to go and look at the back entries of, and has grown into a nonprofit uh, organization. And he's going to talk to us today about the energy of tomorrow, the promise, failure, and possible rebirth of nuclear power. Uh, the format's going to be Jason's going to talk for the better part of an hour. Then we're going to have a Q&A, so you'll line up uh, at the mic over there if you have questions. And this way, the questions will get recorded for our online uh, future audience, as well as being slightly amplified here in the room. OK, thank you, everyone. And uh, without further ado, I welcome Jason Crawford. Uh, thank you very much, Greg, and to the Salem Center for having me. Um, great to be here. Great to see all of you. Thanks for showing up for this talk. Um, excited to talk about this. This is a very interesting topic. Um, so I write in general about the history of technology and the philosophy of progress. How was industrial civilization created, and what does it all mean? Um, and so today I want to talk about nuclear power. More than 50 years ago, uh, nuclear power was considered to be the energy of tomorrow. Um, people were very excited about it and, and thought it had a very bright future. It was going to cause the desert to bloom and bring cheap, uh, abundant energy to everyone. But it didn't really pan out that way. Uh, today, we still get the vast majority of our energy from uh, coal, oil, and gas. If you're having a hard time finding nuclear on this chart, it's that little sliver um, right there that never grew beyond a few percent of total worldwide energy consumption. So why was everybody so excited about this? Why did it seem obvious to people from the beginning that nuclear was the future? And why didn't it turn out that way? I'm going to answer that, but I want to begin at the beginning, because I want to place this in sort of the grand historical context of industrial progress and of energy usage in particular. Before the Industrial Revolution, energy basically came from three sources, or I should say mechanical energy, uh, came from wind, water, and muscle. The muscle could be human or animal power. These sources are fine as far as they go, but uh, a problem with them is that they're hard to concentrate in one place, and they're hard to scale up. So uh, you can't really make the wind or the water run any faster than they naturally do. Uh, you can't breed a, a stronger horse beyond certain biological limits. So if you want more horsepower, the only way to get it is to add more horses. <laughs> so this is an actual uh, photograph from around the turn of the last century of a large piece of agricultural equipment known as a combine harvester being pulled through the fields of, I believe this is in California. Uh, it takes a team of two to three dozen horses to pull one of these um, through the fields, which made them impractical for almost all uses. They were only used in a, uh, on a few farms in California uh, until the invention of the gasoline tractor. Similarly, if you want more power from the river, you have to build a bigger water wheel. This is one of the largest ever created and possibly the most powerful ever created uh, at the Burden Iron Works in upstate New York. If you look carefully, you can see in the lower left, uh, there's a man standing there. Uh, so for comparison, this thing's about 60 feet tall. Uh, this is after it was taken out of the river and is just kind of on display here. But um, it's enormous. It uh, is said to have been the inspiration for the Ferris wheel. And yet, it only generated around, uh, by one estimate, 500 horsepower. It's about the, you know, a souped-up race car engine. This changed forever with the invention of the engine, starting with the steam engine in the 1700s. The crucial breakthrough of the engine is that it connects, uh, it gives us a, a new source of mechanical energy. It allows us to turn heat energy into mechanical energy. And we already had sources of heat. Uh, in particular, we had fuels, which had been used uh, for a very long time, of course, for warmth, for cooking, for um, smelting metals, kilning limestone and clay. Um, but now we could use fuel for a, for a new purpose, for mechanical energy, for agricultural machinery, for factories, for transportation. And so the invention of the engine created an enormous demand for fuel. 
Uh, now, throughout the ages, people have burned you know, pretty much whatever they could get their hands on. Uh, in earliest times, and still today in the poorest regions of the world, people burn brush, crop residues such as straw, even animal dung. What you're looking at here is a pile of, I believe, cow pies um, that, are, that are being used to make a fire. It gives a fire, uh, certainly enough. It gives you warmth and a bit of light, but it re also gives off a really noxious smoke that is hazardous to both the eyes and the lungs. Um, uh, indoor smoke from such fires is a cause of cataracts and blindness. So as people become wealthier, they climb up the energy ladder. They go to better and better fuel sources. Uh, once you get a little bit of income, you move away from crop waste and dung. Uh, you're burning things like wood and coal. If you can do even better by uh, burning refined liquid fuels, such as kerosene, gasoline, um, uh, natural gas, and so forth. So um, as we go through the history of progress in fuels, we see that they get better on many dimensions. So one is simply the convenience of handling. Solid fuels have to be hauled and shoveled and carried around. Um, liquid or uh, gaseous fuels can be pumped, which is much more convenient. Um, imagine going to the, uh, you know, to the fuel station and having to shovel coal into your car, right, as opposed to just sticking a, a pump in there. Um, the refined fuels, uh, kerosene and gasoline and so forth, also give off a lot less uh, atmospheric emissions. So they don't have the thick smoke of wood and coal. Um, they've got a little bit of, of, uh, of emissions, but not as much as the unrefined solid fuels. Uh, those unrefined fuels also left behind ash, which had to be taken care of and carried away. Um, the, uh, the refined fuels basically don't have um, ash that they leave behind, or just a little bit of soot, maybe. And crucially, the fuels uh, over time have gotten denser. So the energy density of fuels, measure, measured as the amount of energy per unit of mass, um, is a critical attribute of the fuels. Uh, so you can see there's about a three-fold improvement here or more from, you know, from the dung up to the, the gasoline and the natural gas. What might the next evolution of fuels look like along these axes? Right? If we had the next um, leap in fuel technology, where do you think it might fall? In particular, where do you think it might fall on the density axis? How much more dense than previous fuels might it be? Just think about that. We'll come back to it. What all these fuels have in common is that they are based on combustion. Combustion is a chemical process in which uh, a fuel molecule combines with an oxygen molecule to give off heat. Uh, in, in this example, burning methane. But in the early 20th century, physics was reaching a new stage. Uh, scientists such as uh, this guy, Dr. Rutherford, were peering inside the atom and they were learning amazing new things about what was going on in the nucleus. In particular, they discovered nuclear radiation. Uh, they discovered a number of different forms of radiation. Pictured here are alpha, beta, and gamma radiation, uh, all of which basically just spitting out different types of particles uh, from the nucleus, and each of these reactions gives off a certain amount of, of energy. But they also discovered fission. In fission, you're not just spitting out a tiny particle from the nucleus, it's actually splitting pretty much in half um, and, and spitting out two smaller atoms along with you know, a couple of extra neutrons. And this gives off the most energy of any nuclear reaction. Um, in fact, it gives off far more energy than chemical reactions. So here is the fundamental physical basis uh, of why nuclear technology is exciting. Uh, when you combust one molecule of methane, uh, you get an amount of energy that is about nine electron volts. You don't have to worry about what an electron volt is. The, the point is that there are nine of them. And uh, with a fission reaction, you give off about 200 million. So the point here is the ratio between those two, right? More than a factor of 10 million in the amount of energy that's given off per molecule that undergoes one of these reactions. So it turns out that the next leap of energy density was not 10% more, it was not uh, twice as much, it was not 10 times as much, it was about a million times as much. This means that the, uh, a, a lifetime amount of energy for one person fits in the palm of your hand. It's about the a uranium, amount of uranium about the size of a golf ball contains, in theory, you know, theoretical maximum energy you could extract for that is enough for, you know, for one person, uh, uh, average person uh, for a lifetime. Imagine carrying around a lifetime of energy in your pocket. So the next leap was uh, a million times in terms of energy density. Um, and what this means is, oh, so also it gives off basically no atmospheric emissions. 
Um, it does give off solid waste, uh, creates solid waste, but because of the energy density, the amount of waste created per unit of energy is extremely low. And then similarly, when it comes to handling, uh, handling basically goes from something that's like a daily operation to something that's more like annual maintenance. Uh, anything that uses nuclear fuel generally doesn't have to be, the fuel doesn't have to be changed out uh, more than annually, and sometimes it's even much less frequently than that. Uh, it's also extremely cheap. Again, this is a consequence of the density. Uh, uranium can be uh, many times more expensive per kilogram, but because of the insane energy density of nuclear fuel, it ends up being much less expensive per unit of energy produced. So nuclear promised cheap, dense, abundant, reliable, clean energy. Just on the basic physics of how it works. No wonder it seemed like the energy of tomorrow. How do we harness it? Well, I want to go into some of the details of nuclear engineering here. Um, I want to actually explain to you how a nuclear power plant works uh, in essence, because for a couple of reasons. One is I want to demystify this technology. I want you to understand the basics of it so that you can reason about it from first principles. Uh, second, I think that understanding some of the details of nuclear engineering is really necessary to understand the potential uh, that it has and the potential that we have still not tapped. The reason that combustion fuels are useful is that they can be ignited very simply by a spark or a match or what have you. Um, we can store up the energy in the fuel for as long as we like, and then we can release it on command. Uh, and then we can damp the fuel out again, damp the fire out when we're done with it. If we're going to take advantage of nuclear fission for energy, we need something similar. We need a way to begin the nuclear fission reactions, to maintain it steady, and then to, to ramp it down when we're done. So uh, we need controlled fission. And the way we're going to do that is, it turns out that there are certain isotopes uh, of certain elements where that can be uh, induced to fission by the presence of neutrons. So we're going to control the neutrons to control the fission. Uh, in particular, let's take an example, uranium-235. When it encounters a neutron moving at just the right speed, captures that neutron and absorbs it into its nucleus, briefly becoming uranium-236. Uh, the number just indicates the total number of protons plus neutrons. So 235 plus a neutron becomes 236. Uh, this arrangement, however, with the extra energy added from that absorption is unstable. So it very quickly fissions into uh, two smaller atoms. In this case, we're looking at barium and krypton, but it can be you know, a number of different things. Uh, plus a few neutrons are, are thrown off. Now, can you see where this might be going? One neutron started the fission, and a fission event then creates two to three neutrons. What this gives us the potential for, as was realized in around the 1930s, is a nuclear chain reaction. So each neutron that comes out of the fission can potentially cause another fission. Um, and so if uh, each fission event on average creates two more fission events, then you get this exponentially uh, increasing uh, rate of fission as you see here. So this would be the equivalent of we've just put a spark on a fire and it, uh, and it has started the fire and the fire is spreading. If we damp things down a little bit, perhaps by capturing some of those neutrons so they don't all go create fission events, then uh, if we get it to the point where each fission is creating, on average, one more fission event, then you can see here things are holding steady. And so this is like a, a fire that's burning in a furnace at a constant temperature, neither increasing nor decreasing. And then, of course, if we got it, so that if we really damped it down so that each fission event creates less than one subsequent fission event, then the rate of fission would be going down, and that's like putting a fire out. Okay, that's the basis for our technology. But there are still many engineering decisions that we need to make to create a workable power plant. So first, what are we actually going to do with the heat that we generate from all this fission? Well, a very basic thing to do is to use it to boil water, turn that into high-pressure steam, and drive the steam through a turbine. A turbine, you can think of it as just like a metal windmill, except uh, instead of wind, we're going to use high-pressure steam you know, being driven through pipes to turn, uh, to turn the windmill, to turn the turbine. And that can spin an electromagnet, which generates electricity, um, just the way in pretty much every other uh, electri electrical uh, generator. We're also going to need to choose a fuel, and a particular isotope of a particular element or, or mix of them that can be used as our fuel. Um, Uranium-235 is the one natural isotope that fissions in the way that I just described, and so it's often uh, the fuel. This is a, um, a lump of it here. You can see, by the way, that um, you really can hold it uh, just in gloved hands. 
The type of radiation that uranium gives off when it's not undergoing all this fission is uh, a type that is easily blocked by a pretty thin layer of clothing. So uh, handling it with gloves is safe enough. Now, one further challenge is that in naturally occurring uranium, only about 0.7% of it is U-235. Uh, the vast majority of the rest of it is a different isotope called U-238 that has three extra neutrons. Um, U-238 does not undergo fission in the way that I described. We'll talk about it a little bit later. But uh, for the type of uh, reactor that I'm describing right now, you want to use the U-235. 0.7% um, of it is not a lot. So we would like to enrich this fuel up to about 5% U-235. Um, incidentally, weapons grade uranium is like 80% or more. So uh, you know, the, the type that's used uh, fuel in a reactor is, is very far from that. Now this term enriched is a little bit misleading because uh, it sounds as if we are adding something into the fuel, but what we are actually doing of course is taking something away. The way that you enrich nuclear fuel is by removing the vast majority of the U-238 so that what you are left with is a more concentrated uh, sample on average. We'll come back to this as well. Next, you need to choose a physical form for the fuel to take. Uh, and a traditional answer is to make it into little pellets about the size of a gummy bear. You can hold it in your hand. Uh, and then to stack these in a metal, a hollow metal rod called a fuel rod. So you've got this metal cladding, uh, and then you put a number of fuel rods together into a fuel assembly. Now the next challenge is there's a physical detail that I glossed over, which is that when the neutrons come out of a fission reaction, they're moving very quickly. And uh, they're actually moving too quickly to be captured by another uranium atom right away. You need to slow them down. Uh, if we don't, they're just going to escape. So uh, we need some substance called a moderator that will slow down the neutrons such that they uh, then can get captured by more uranium atoms. There are a lot of different substances that can work as a moderator. The neutrons just have to kind of bounce around in there. Um, it turns out plain water works pretty well as a moderator. And so we're going to choose water for our moderator. We will uh, surround the fuel rods with water and the neutrons will bounce around in there and slow down. Again, we need some way to control the reaction. We need some way to turn it off, turn it on, ramp it up and down. And so we're going to do that with uh, another set of rods called control rods that go in between the fuel rods. They're represented in green here. These are made of a material that absorbs neutrons. Typically, uh, a metal alloy like an alloy of uh, silver, indium, and cadmium is a popular uh, combination. Uh, those absorb neutrons at a variety of different speeds, so no matter how they're whizzing around, um, you'll, you'll grab them. And so when the control rods are fully inserted, they're dampening, they're capturing all the neutrons, uh, and, they, and they can't uh, create the fission reaction. Um, when you pull them out, they're out of the way, the neutrons can fly around, and now the, um, uh, the, the, the fission can ramp up. That's one way of controlling things. It's one major way. There's other ways as well. We can also put a substance in the water, like boron, um, which will capture neutrons and so forth. We have multiple ways of doing it within our reactor. Okay, so now we've got a fission reaction going. It's, it's analogous to a fire burning. Um, we need to take away that heat somehow from the core. A lot of heat's getting generated in the core. We need to transfer it to somewhere where it can do useful work. We want it to ultimately boil water and, and that's gonna drive a steam turbine, right? So how do we continually get the heat away from the reactor core to where it's gonna boil the water? Um, we need a substance that can move heat energy around, and such a substance is called a coolant. A little bit funnily misleading name because it makes you sound like its main job is to cool something down, um, but its job can equally be to heat something else up you know, elsewhere. A coolant is just a fluid that will transfer heat around. Um, so water, we're already using water as a moderator. Water actually works pretty well as a coolant as well. So it can do double duty in this design, acting as both moderator and coolant. The water is going to run around in a circuit and uh, carry the heat away from the core and, and to where we're going to generate the steam. Now you might be wondering, if we're using water, why don't we just boil the water and the water can just boil. We, why do we need to, do it need to transfer the heat to somewhere else where it's going to, the steam is going to be generated in a different place? You can do it that way, and there is such a thing called a boiling water reactor, but there's a good reason not to, which is that um, we want to actually want to get the water uh, and then the reactor core to a higher temperature than the boiling point of water. We want to get the temperature higher because that makes the engine overall more efficient. You're extracting energy from the difference between two temperatures. So if you can get the one temperature as hot as possible, then you can get as efficient as possible. So what we're going to do uh, in the uh, leftmost uh, part of this diagram, you can see the orange, or the reddish orange loop. Um, that is the reactor core and, and the water. And what we're going to do is we're going to pressurize the water 
to very high pressures, well over 100 atmospheres. And when you do this, uh, water will then get to a higher temperature without boiling. So you can have water at, I don't remember the exact temperatures, I think it's around 3 to 350 uh, Celsius, well above the 100 Celsius boiling point of water. Okay, so we're going to have one loop that goes around, one circuit that goes around with very high pressure, very hot water, and it's going to uh, transfer the heat from the core to, in another part of the loop, um, uh, a secondary circuit that has water at regular pressure that is getting boiled and turned into steam and driven through the turbine. That's our basic design for what is known as a pressurized water reactor. Um, now, this design is, uh, can be made quite safe, but it does have a couple of inherent features that, um, are, that are safety drawbacks and that need special engineering to deal with. One is the pressure. A highly pressurized uh, reactor, a highly pressurized container is always a hazard in any engineering design. 100 or more atmospheres, you've just got a lot pushing out, and if anything ruptures, it could, uh, you, you can have a steam explosion, basically, or a pressure explosion. The other thing is that to keep the water moving in that primary circuit requires active pumping. So you have, uh, you have pumps that are actively moving the water around through that circuit all the time, and if they fail for whatever reason, or if you lose power to them, et cetera, um, then you've got a situation where the water is not circulating, the heat can build up in the core, and you're at risk of a meltdown. So these are some of the, uh, the hazards of, of this design. Again, not fatal flaws, but uh, keep this in mind for when we are gonna talk in a little bit about advanced designs. Now, the other thing is, of course, eventually your fuel will get burned up and uh, the uranium will fission and you're going to be left with a bunch of things that are not uranium. And in fact, they are uh, hazardous radioactive products in their own right. In fact, the type of radiation they're giving off is more hazardous than, than what the original uranium was giving off when you were holding it in gloved hands. So this does have to be handled uh, with special care. However, the good news is that because of the insane fuel density of nuclear power, very little waste is generated uh, per unit of energy. So here is a pad where you've got some four dozen or less uh, casks, concrete casks, holding nuclear waste. This all came from one nuclear power plant. What time period do you think this might have been over that the plant generated this? Is this a day's worth of waste? A month? A year? A decade? 28 years. It is the entire lifetime of the Connecticut Yankee uh, power plant, during which point it generated more than 100 terawatt hours of uh, electricity. Uh, so it was generating one or two of these casks per year. And what you're looking at here, by the way, is mostly concrete, uh, which is shielding uh, the, the radiation. In fact, there's so much concrete shielding around it that you can go right up to it and hug it. You can do that uh, if you want to show off how safe it is and how low the radiation level is just immediately outside the cask. You can also do it if you just want to show your deep and abiding love for nuclear power. <laughs> okay. So, um, what happened to nuclear power when it was, after it was invented? Well, in the early years, uh, nuclear was growing very rapidly. It was growing exponentially. Uh, it was on track to, if that growth rate had been continued, to essentially provide roughly 100% of world electricity by now. But again, as we know, that's not what happened. The growth rate around the mid-1970s started to stall, and eventually uh, the growth stagnated. The United States now gets about 20% of its electricity and about 8% of its total energy from nuclear, and the rest of the world is only at about half that level. So what happened? Well, the proximal cause of nuclear's stagnation is that it is very expensive. So nuclear energy, nuclear electricity is some of the most uh, expensive energy that we have. It's around $150 per megawatt hour or 15 cents kilowatt hour if you're, if you're more used to thinking in those terms, compared to these, other, um, to these other modes of energy production. Now the reason for this is not the fuel, because as we've seen, the fuel is extremely cheap. It's not even the daily operations of the plant. It's entirely in the upfront costs the construction and financing costs of a nuclear plant. So it turns out it's very expensive and slow to build a nuclear plant, and by the time you're done building it, you have an enormous uh, debt or capital cost that you've accumulated. You have to make that back by selling the electricity at a higher rate of profit. If you could build faster and cheaper, then the electricity itself could, could get a lot cheaper. Now, every technology starts out 
expensive in its early days. Um, and most technologies come down what is known in economics as a learning curve or an experience curve. They get cheaper the more that you do of them. Um, so uh, typically you could plot things. So here's an example with batteries. You can see the curve was relatively shallow in the early 90s and then got a lot steeper around 1996. Um, but the point is this is a log-log a plot and the x-axis is not time, it is total cumulative capacity manufactured or installed. Um, and so as we installed more and more megawatt hours of, of battery capacity, the, the prices came down exponentially. Now this was happening in nuclear in the early years. Uh, so for a while, up until around 1970-ish, the costs were coming down a fairly steep learning curve, decreasing about 25% for every doubling of worldwide nuclear capacity. And then something happened. The curve reversed, and we started to get negative learning. Prices were going up and up uh, exponentially with exponentially installed capacity. Here's what this looks like on a regular old uh, non-log plot. These are prices to, to build in uh, the United States, construction costs um, per unit of, of generating capacity um, plotted against the completion date. So you see uh, plants that were completed in the, in the 1980s, which basically means plants that were started in the 70s or even the 60s, um, had skyrocketing costs. And not surprisingly, once this started happening, people stopped ordering uh, nuclear plants. I believe no nuclear plant was ordered in the US uh, after 1974 until the end of the century. And you can see the construction permits just went to zero by 1980. Uh, here's uh, a similar chart to the, to the two, one two charts ago, but worldwide. So the blue dots are the, the, the cost increase that we were just looking at for the USA. Uh, the other colors represent other countries. Green is Japan. Uh, the red dots are France. They managed to maintain only a 2x cost increase rather than the 5, 6, 10x that the United States saw. Um, that's part of why France is able to get uh, the majority of its energy now, its electricity rather, from nuclear power. Um, and uh, Korea is one of the few that's actually maintained its costs uh, fairly well even up into the present day. That's Korea. Yep, yeah, yeah. The cost is driven by the complexity. So a, uh, a nuclear plant's about the size and scale of a coal plant. Um, and in fact, they're pretty much identical except for how they generate the heat that boils the water. Um, but a nuclear plant is much more complex in a number of ways. It uses more materials uh, for all sorts of purposes. It has more systems such as uh, emergency backup systems. There's a more laborious quality insurance inspection process much higher levels of certification required by the authorities and much lower tolerances, tolerances accepted by those authorities. Uh, here's an example of what this does to just the materials and the installation cost of those materials. Steel and concrete are the, the main materials that a, that a power plant is going to be made out of. And you can see here the nuclear premium of what it takes to just procure and install these materials in a nuclear plant versus uh, you know, a similar construction, uh, you know, like a coal plant or some other construction um, project that's not a nuclear plant. Are these physically different types of steel or is it just the regulatory costs of getting your steel approved to be for your plant? Um, yeah, it's a variety of things. So I believe for steel they do use um, different grades. I'm not certain of that. Um, there's also the, the, again, there's the inspection, there's the certification, there's the labor cost to install it. It just literally takes longer to install um, like there's more on-site labor for all of these things. Yeah. Okay, where did all of this layers and layers of complexity come from? Well, let's back up a bit and look at how nuclear power evolved socially and politically. Nuclear had the misfortune to be born in wartime and to make its introduction to the world as a horrifically destructive weapon, right? the worst that the world had ever seen. It was, from the very beginning, linked in people's minds to, uh, to death and destruction. And even when the US went on an Atoms for Peace campaign touting the peaceful uses of nuclear technology, it was still under the tight control of the US military bureaucracy. When it did come out uh, for civilian uses and start to get used in power plants, it ran smack into the burgeoning social movements of the 1960s, the anti-war movement, uh, the environmentalist movement, and so forth, who put intense social pressures on it. The environmentalist movement in the 1960s was, uh, much more so than today, was really focused on uh, overpopulation. 
So even more than worrying about what could go wrong with nuclear, uh, many of the environmental activists were also worrying about what could go right. Um, a phenomenon uh, dubbed ergophobia by uh, J. Storrs Hall. Um, side note, he's the author of a book called Where Is My Flying Car, which I highly recommend. He coined this term ergophobia as a fear of energy. Uh, so Paul Ehrlich, the author of The Population Bomb, said that giving society cheap, abundant energy would be the equivalent of giving an idiot child a machine gun. Uh, another uh, commentator mentioned it would be a little short of disastrous for us to discover a source of cheap, abundant energy because of what we might do with it. So all of this led to uh, a rapidly escalating and highly turbulent regulatory environment for nuclear, especially in the late 60s and into the early 70s. There were lengthy review processes from the Atomic Energy Commission and later its successor, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, NRC. Uh, engineers were asked to design for rare or impossible scenarios, such as the double-ended guillotine break in which a pipe uh, breaks in two places at once uh, simultaneously and the, just a whole chunk of it comes out. Um, which basically can't happen. There's very little provision for testing. So there's this catch-22 in nuclear that you can't test without a license, and you can't get the license until you prove that your design is going to work uh, and is safe. So the design review can't really be based or can't easily be based on data or input from testing. During construction, there was little ability to improvise solutions on site. Um, if something relatively minor had to be changed about the design, often those, uh, those, those design changes had to be run up the hierarchy and get high-level approval. And I think most insidiously, um, the radiation standards that were enforced by the regulators were ultimately decoupled, were not linked to uh, provable human health impacts. In particular, um, the NRC formally adopted a policy called ALARA, which stands for as low as reasonably achievable. Now, so what this means is, so you might think that the way we would uh, regulate nuclear health impacts is to say, look, uh, here is what science, uh, physics, and medicine, and physiology tell us is a, uh, the level of uh, radiation exposure that will cause uh, health harms such as cancer risk. And then we're just going to say, okay, you can't get anywhere near that. The safe threshold is something with a big buffer away from that level. And then you've got to get your radiation exposure down to that level. But you would not think that, uh, the, that the regulators would drive you to actually lower the radiation levels beyond that safe threshold. That's exactly what ALARA does. Um, it essentially says that there is no threshold below which we're going to allow you to stop making investments. You just have to get it as low as is reasonable. And what's reasonable changes all the time because uh, the better technology that we get or the more uh, uh, cost buffer we have, frankly, um, the more we can invest into lowering the radiation, the more the regulator is going to force you uh, to do so. In fact, if nuclear ever got much cheaper than other forms of energy, that would essentially be a sign that the regulator hadn't done his job because he could have had you spend that extra uh, you know, money on, on even more safety, um, you know, or, or rather uh, mechanisms that would lower radiation even further. Added on, to, on top of this was a lot of um, community opposition and political obstructionism. Uh, as a case study, the Shoreham nuclear power plant in uh, New York was uh, started, the project was started in 1966 with a cost estimate of under $100 million, ran into years and years of delays at different stages of the process. At one point, it was held up in community hearings. Um, at another point, when the plant was finished and basically ready to open, uh, the local community refused to uh, participate in mandatory planning exercises, um, and that held it up for another few years until the NRC gave them a waiver. The plant was eventually abandoned more than 20 years later when the costs had ballooned to over $5 billion. Um, and this is not the only case study like this. To take a more recent example, uh, New Scale is a project working on a, an advanced reactor design, uh, a modern uh, iteration of the, the pressurized water reactor that we discussed a little bit earlier. They just got their uh, design certification approval from the NRC. To go through this process took 41 months of review and many years before that of pre-review um, activities. Generated about 2 million pages of documentation, which took over 250,000 review hours uh, to, to complete the review of. Uh, and incidentally, applicants to the NRC pay the NRC by the hour to review their applications. So this came in at a bill of over $500 million. Uh, a design certification uh, uh, from the NRC, by the way, does not allow you to construct or operate a plant. For that, you have to get a construction license and then an operating license. So this is just saying that your basic design reference design is, is, uh, is good. 
in a letter, an open letter to the NRC complaining about this process and advocating certain reforms, New Scale deadpanned that the level of effort that this took, uh, quote, may not be repeatable for future reviews. They didn't plan to spend half a billion uh, uh, investment from one company to get one design approved. Now you might ask, well, where was the pushback, right? So very often, if, if industry is getting regulations pushed on it, the industry will push back, there's a negotiation, maybe it'll land in some reasonable place. Well, nuclear has an unfortunate history here. So first, um, the customers of nuclear technology are ultimately gonna, gonna be uh, electrical utilities, which are regulated monopolies. They don't have a lot of incentive to cut costs. In fact, they sort of have a perverse incentive uh, to, to, to not cut them or to even allow costs to rise because uh, due to a, 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 um, something in the law called rate basing, they, uh, the, what they're allowed to charge is essentially their costs plus a profit margin. The profit margin is essentially guaranteed by law. So the more higher their costs are, the higher the profit is. Um, on top of this, uh, so one author, Jack Devaney, who wrote a, a book I recommend called Why Nuclear Power Has Been a Flop. Um, he's also a nuclear founder himself. I'll, I'll mention his company later. Um, but he says that what part of what happened was this uh, rapid escalation in the regulations happened during the oil crisis when energy prices were extremely high. And so the, uh, the incentive on, the, on anybody in the energy industry was not to cut costs, but to push projects through as fast as possible. And so essentially they just said okay to all the regulations. Uh, and then when the crisis was over and energy costs dropped again, uh, regulation is sort of a ratchet. It pretty much goes in one direction. It's very hard to get the regulations to come down after you've already said yes to them. Um, the other thing is that a number of companies in the industry decided not to, uh, to beat this, but to join it uh, and to pivot into profiting off of regulatory capture. Turns out it's very profitable to retrofit old power plants with the latest uh, safety designs or to spend you know, billions of dollars cleaning up nuclear waste in areas that are you know, showing a level of radiation that is lower than the natural background radiation in, you know, in some countries. There are second and third and fourth order consequences of all of this. It led to very slow learning cycles in the nuclear industry, engineering cycles measured in decades, very little standardization. Even today in the US, uh, nuclear projects are often built as these bespoke mega projects with a lot of custom engineering that's very expensive. Um, this is not how they do it in, in uh, you know, places like Korea and now China where they're starting to build more and cheaper. Um, and there's been no fundamental advancement really in uh, nuclear reactor design since essentially the beginning of the industry. That pressurized water reactor that I walked you through is still about 80% of nuclear plants today. And uh, it's basically the thing that was come up for, for nuclear submarines you know, starting in the 1940s. So we have barely scratched the surface of the potential for nuclear engineering. And that's the real tragedy here. Um, so just, you know, iterations on the traditional design, such as what NuScale is doing, show a lot of great features. For instance, um, they can be made, uh, the, the reactors can be made in small modular forms, such as the module that you're looking at here. Something like a dozen of these might be installed in, um, in a NuScale power plant. What this does is it allows you to uh, build these very standardized reactor cores in a factory setting, rather than having to build it on site, you could take advantage of all of the um, uh, cost advantages of economies of scale and, and mass manufacturing technologies. You can transport the parts using regular transportation, like on trucks and rail. You don't have to have special barges you know, come in with special parts. So this can really drive down costs. But this is just an iteration on the, the classic design that we've been using for a long time. Every aspect, every design choice that I walked you through in the middle of this talk, can be modified. So let's walk through what some of those alternate choices might be. Okay, first off, we don't have to make our fuel into pellets, those little gummy bear sized things. There are other form factors for the fuel. What we're looking at here is something called a triso, um, I forget, a gra they call it a grain or a seed. This is magnified many times. It's about, it's very tiny, it's about the size of a poppy seed, just a few millimeters. Uh, but it consists of these multiple layers. Triso stands for tristructural isotropic. And so um, the, uh, the uranium fuel or whatever nuclear fuel you put is, is the core in the middle. And then it has these protective layers around it, uh, which trap the radiation, the harmful radiation products inside and also make it, make it basically meltdown proof. This, is, this structure is not going to degrade even at very high temperatures. 
You also don't have to put these into fuel rods. You can put them, for instance, into um, a graphite ball called a nuclear pebble. It's about the size of a billiard ball. You can hold it in your hand. And this might contain uh, many of those little seeds inside it. And then you can uh, do something fun with this. You can make a nuclear reactor that kind of looks like a gumball machine. And so rather than having to extract the fuel you know, for regular maintenance and then like replace it with fresh fuel, you can just kind of drop new fuel, fuel uh, uh, pebbles into the top here and they filter through and ultimately they come out, the spent ones come out the bottom. And in fact, you can inspect them and see if they're still good. And if they're used up, you can toss them. And if they're still good, you just drop them back in the top of the gumball machine. Um, another thing about this design is it does not use uh, water for the coolant. It uses gas, in particular, it uses helium, which has uh, a number of advantages. Helium can um, operate, it doesn't have to operate at super high pressures in order to get hot. Um, it's an inert gas, it doesn't react with anything, it's not corrosive. Uh, it also doesn't become radioactive, um, you know, the way that, that other uh, products within the core can. Um, so we can use different coolants, uh, just like we can use different forms of fuel. X Energy is a, uh, is a startup or a nuclear project that's combining all the things I just talked about. They're making a helium-cooled uh, pebble bed reactor using this triso fuel. But the fuel doesn't even have to be solid. There are liquid nuclear fuels. Uh, in particular, you can have a form of fuel called molten salt, where, which is, is just what it sounds like. You've got salts, and you get them high, a high enough temperature that it turns to liquid. Uh, and then you can dissolve some uranium salts uh, in the mixture. And so now the whole thing, your fuel, it's not rods or pellets or anything. It's just a big vat of, um, you know, of, of, of nuclear liquid, essentially, generating heat. Um, one of the advantages of this, so like the helium one, it does not have to operate at super high pressures. It can operate at, at regular uh, pressure because salt can get to very high temperatures, uh, even at regular pressure. Um, another thing you can do with it is you can continuously, so if you look on the left of this diagram, uh, you see this thing that's labeled reprocessing module. So the fuel can be continuously cycled through a reprocessing module where the waste gets filtered out and then fresh fuel uh, you know, goes back in. Uh, this is analogous to your kidneys uh, filtering the bloodstream. right? Uh, so this means that you're never taking away large you know, amounts of nuclear waste, uh, nor are you building up uh, hazardous products that could be used for you know, weapons proliferation or anything like that. Another feature I want to point out on this diagram is at the bottom. Uh, you see this thing labeled freeze valve and underneath it is the holding tank. This is an example of what many of these advanced designs um, have. It's something called a passive safety mechanism. So rather than those uh, active pumps uh, of the traditional design that have to actively be pumping the coolant through the system, uh, this is a passive safety measure where uh, if anything goes wrong, if the, um, if the, the freezing of the valve um, stops working or if the temperature just gets too high, that valve will melt and uh, all of the molten fuel will drop into the holding tank below where it gets spread out so thin that the, that the, um, the radiation is damped down. Um, so this is an example of a passive safety measure. Uh, many of these advanced designs are claimed at least to be, quote, walk away safe, meaning the operators could literally walk out, even in the, the case of, a, um, of, of some sort of a failure or a, or a meltdown potential, and basically there'd, there'd be no meltdown, um, you know, for, you'd have at least like three days uh, to, you know, to get things going again because of the passive mechanisms. Thorcon is an example of a startup that is uh, building a, uh, a molten salt reactor in Indonesia. Uh, Thorcon is so named because they're actually not using uranium for the fuel. They're using thorium. Uh, and this brings us to the next design parameter that we can vary. You don't have to use U-235. You can use thorium or you can even use uh, U-238. Now, remember, U-238 is what makes up uh, the vast majority of natural uranium. We said that we weren't going to use it in our previous design because uh, it does not fission when it encounters a neutron. Well, what does happen when it encounters a neutron? It does absorb the neutron, and through a process of decay, it ultimately ends up as plutonium-239. Now, plutonium-239 is an interesting isotope because when it encounters a neutron, it fissions like uranium. So what you can do is you can create something called a breeder reactor, where you start off with one isotope with the uh, deliberate engineering design that uh, in the reactor, neutrons will be changing your original isotope into another isotope that can then fission. So you can start with U-238 and then gradually turn it uh, neutron by neutron into plutonium-239, uh, which can then undergo the fission. Now, remember this diagram we were looking at. You, the U-238 is the vast majority of the fuel. Even after we have enriched it, it's the vast majority of the fuel, right? And we're throwing out enormous amounts of U-238. 
um, just in the, in the fuel enrichment process. So being able to use one of these breeder reactors uh, makes it to, you know, it makes us able to get like another order of magnitude of efficiency and density out of the fuel. We can actually have very high uh, burn up utilization of the material rather than only extracting, you know, a small percentage of the energy as we do in, in the traditional design. A nuclear startup called Aklo is building a, a breeder reactor that is designed to be installed in remote communities and will not need refueling for something like 20 years. Right? So we've gone beyond replace the fuel as annual maintenance. Now essentially you have something like a lifetime of fuel built into the machine from the beginning. And I haven't even touched on fusion. Um, which gets you like another order of magnitude uh, on, on all these axes beyond what I've even talked about so far. Uh, fusion is still essentially a science experiment. Um, we don't have the technology to make it work yet. Probably won't be here for decades. So um, I'm going to mostly cut it from this talk, but I just had to mention it because when we're talking about the potential for nuclear in the, fusion, in, in the future, uh, fusion is actually um, some of the biggest potential. So it turns out that all of the conventional criticisms that are, uh, that are leveled at nuclear can actually be addressed by alternate engineering designs. If you're worried about meltdowns, there are meltdown-proof fuels, there are meltdown-proof reactors. Uh, if you're worried about waste, well, there are breeder reactors that can process waste and use it as fuel. If you're worried about proliferation, there are non-proliferation uh, designs. In fact, the reason that proliferation is even a concern in the first place is because the technology that we have today was chosen by the US government in the 1940s to be dual use. They wanted a reactor type that could actually produce fuel for nuclear weapons because they were interested in making nuclear weapons. So essentially, the, the re this reactor type was designed for proliferation. So if you wanted to design it for non-proliferation, you could do that. Now, in my opinion, none of these are fatal flaws, even in the traditional pressurized water reactor. There's nothing wrong with it, and these shouldn't be blockers. Um, but anybody who says that these concerns are sort of like inherent concerns of, um, you know, of nuclear, I think just doesn't understand the full range of nuclear engineering possibilities. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm actually one of those people that has, has significant concerns, because if sure. your waste that you say you can hug in a cast, um, actually is radioactive for 10,000 years, that's a very difficult time frame to design for. Um, and I, I just think you kind of glossed over that, and I just want to bring that point up. I, I do hold a lot of um, optimism for these breeder reactors and things, which, which is why I wouldn't pan nuclear entirely, but yeah. I think it's a real concern. And I think that's something that if nuclear wants to develop further, it needs to squarely address. Sure. Let me save that for the end. Um, but uh, please feel free to remind me about that at the end. Okay. Let me get through the rest of the talk. I mean, look, you're right. It is a concern. And we have to engineer for it. And that's, I mean, that's the basic answer. But sure, we can discuss that more at the end. Um, so when I think about the, the history and the development or lack thereof of nuclear power, I think about an analogy to computing. So in 1946, the first electronic computer, uh, fully electronic computer, the ENIAC, was completed. In that same year, the US Navy began uh, planning the first nuclear submarine, which was later launched as the USS Nautilate in the next decade. In, <clears throat> in the next decade. Uh, what if computers had evolved, uh, you know, the design and engineering of computers had evolved the same way that nuclear did? Well, we would still today be using mainframes based on vacuum tubes. Transistors or semiconductors would be this sort of thing that somebody experimented with back in the 1960s and then it was eventually abandoned and, and only specialists know about it now. And there would be something like, you know, fewer than a thousand computer, computers in operation worldwide. In such a world, here are some things that people would believe about computers. Computers are large and expensive. They are not affordable to an individual. There's no such thing as a personal computer. They're, uh, they're bought by large governments and, and, uh, and organizations. Computers can't handle graphics or sound, only text and numbers. Computers are power hungry because of those vacuum tubes. Computers aren't useful for communication. Right? They can only do arithmetic and logic. Fortunately, we have the telephone and the fax machine for communication, so we're all set. And these things would be true about, these things are all true of computer technology as it originally existed. Uh, and a lot of things that people believe about, believe that are inherent to nuclear are sort of, you know, similar uh, in, in this regard. Okay. 
Why does this all matter? Why am I, you know, beating the, 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 on a dead technology, right? And, and trying to, re to revive it, especially when there's so much opposition and so many real engineering problems to solve. <clears throat> I want to end this talk by talking about the, the broader context of energy and its importance to life and the economy. Um, and why I think that a, you know, a technology that offers this fundamental abundance and density shouldn't just be you know, abandoned. Energy is uh, very closely linked to overall, overall wealth and well-being. Um, there's a tight correlation between per capita energy usage and per capita GDP. This relationship is reciprocal. Uh, well, energy allows, us, allows people to be more productive and therefore to uh, generate more income. And then when people have more income, they consume energy and the products of energy, which are literally all of our products. And the world needs a lot more energy. There are still almost a billion people who don't have electricity and another three billion or so who don't have uh, clean cooking fuels. Remember we talked in the beginning about the solid versus uh, liquid or gaseous fuels. A lot of people still using solid fuels. Um, so here's a chart of energy usage in different regions of the world. Just uh, to get the entire world up to even the European you know, standard of energy consumption would take approximately a tripling uh, of world energy consumption. And to get it up to the US standard would require even a lot more than that. But we can be more ambitious than this. Nuclear can be used for a lot more than large uh, electrical power plants you know, supplying grid electricity, and we can go much beyond just bringing the entire world up to sort of current standards of living. Uh, Radiant is another nuclear startup who's building a micro reactor that would power essentially, uh, you know, rather than a city, it would power a neighborhood, something like a thousand homes. Uh, with micro reactors, we might not need the electrical grid as such, or we could reduce our dependence on it. Uh, we could have much more decentralized electricity generation. What about vehicles? We already have a nuclear navy, right? Nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers. Why not nuclear cargo ships? Uh, the US actually built a demonstration nuclear cargo ship, the NS Savannah, which operated in the 1960s um, as a demo. Russia uh, has nuclear um, icebreaker ships. So these things can be built and, and operated. Um, and you know, again, a ship like this uses an enormous amount um, of energy and that could be provided by uh, this fuel that basically doesn't, you know, doesn't need refueling for uh, order of years. Nuclear could be used to provide industrial process heat for all sorts of, uh, of chemical and other industrial processes. Ammonia synthesis uh, or other fuel synthesis or um, water desalination, uh, desalination, for example. Currently we burn fuels you know, to do these things. Okay. But all of these are current usages of energy, right? These are things we currently do with, with energy in various forms. We can be even more ambitious than that. Uh, so this is a graph of per capita energy usage in the United States. For a couple of centuries, it was increasing on something of a, a you know, fairly smooth exponential curve, a couple of percent per year increase in, in the per capita um, energy usage. We fell off of this curve around 1970. It flatlined, and, uh, and we've essentially stagnated in our energy usage since. But we should be thinking about how to get back on the curve uh, and how to keep increasing our per capita energy usage. We should be thinking about what we could do with energy abundance. For instance, we could take farming indoors. Uh, farming is one of the few things that we still basically have to do outdoors. We're reliant on sunlight. But indoor farming, uh, vertical farming, or other greenhouse farming, you can use dramatically less um, uh, land area, dramatically less water, um, you've got fewer problems with uh, soil runoff, you may not even have to use uh, much, if any, in the way of pesticides because the pests are mostly outside, right? You know, maybe they get into the building. But. So there are a lot of advantages, but it takes a lot of energy to generate the artificial light. Uh, landfills might be a thing of the past. If we had enough energy to, uh, to process our waste and uh, possibly even reclaim, uh, economically reclaim the materials from it. But we can be even more ambitious than this. What if we thought about the potential for nuclear engineering to develop? Again, something like the way uh, computer engineering has developed over the last 75 years, right? In 75 years, we went from the ENIAC to uh, the smartphone. What if we could miniaturize nuclear technology? What might we get? Well, we might get something like the vision that Isaac Asimov put out in the 1960s. He was looking 50 years ahead and he said, of course, 
The appliances of 2014 will have no electric cords. They will be powered by long-lived batteries uh, running on radioisotopes. What about a nuclear-powered car? Right? Ford uh, had a concept car in the 1950s called the Ford Nucleon. Uh, such a car would not need to be refueled for you know, thousands or even tens of thousands of miles, possibly longer. Okay, but we can be even more ambitious than this. I think to be really ambitious, we need to think planetary scale. One of the things that um, large amounts of energy are good for is materials extraction. Uh, in particular, extracting trace amounts of materials. For instance, from seawater. There are a lot of interesting minerals uh, in seawater in very trace amounts. And with, uh, with energy cheap enough, we could extract them economically. One of these minerals, uh, incidentally, is uranium itself. So you know, higher levels of energy could actually pay for itself by generating its own uh, uranium supply out of the oceans. And if we can do it for the ocean, we can also do it for the atmosphere. Uh, climate change would be a non-issue if we could control the content of the atmosphere, uh, whether through you know, carbon capture and sequestration or other uh, types of you know, pulling gases out of the atmosphere or putting them back in to maintain you know, the ideal composition. Ultimately, we could desalinate uh, enormous amounts of water, irrigate the desert, and yes, make it bloom again. The bottom line is that energy is life. And abundant and extremely dense sources of energy mean abundant and intense opportunities for living, thriving, and flourishing. Nuclear power could have been part of that solution today. We miss the chance to make nuclear the energy of today. But it can still be the energy of tomorrow. Thank you. Then I will take it and I will condense it and ask two. First one, I, I am surprised that the, the accident of Chernobyl, and I think it was in the 86, uh, has not brought to conversation. And the second is that, just to this last, last slide, is uh, even, even if we... So you said that the, the trick is to have abundance of energy, not how do we have abundance of energy. Uh, uh, isn't it that with, even if the nuclear is cheaper or, or we use, you use nuclear power, we still have, we are using a non-sustainable non, uh, uh, um, uh, source, source of energy. Uh, so, so sustainable renewable, the thing is that we are burning a fuel, a fuel that will run to an end. So is, is that a pro is no longer a problem because this lasts for, we will not be there for the time that the fuel uh, uh, extinguishes? Um, <clears throat> there are enormous amounts of nuclear fuel, uh, definitely enough for, I mean, I don't remember how much, it depends on whether you count that we're going to extract it from seawater, um, even extract it from the ocean floor, like, you know, where can we find it? But there's enough for, I don't remember, thousands of years. I mean, enough that by the time we get anywhere close to running out, we should have some new and better technology. Um, so, uh, I mean, when we think about sustainability, I think it's important that we ask ourselves, what exactly is it that we want to sustain? Often we think about sustainability as we're gonna be able to sustain one particular technology, one particular resource, or one particular sort of industrial process forever or indefinitely. I don't think there's actually much value to that. Um, certainly if something's gonna run out like imminently, uh, that is an economic and industrial and technological problem. But what we really wanna sustain in my opinion is growth and progress. We want all of our lives to keep getting better. We want everybody to keep getting wealthier and healthier and happier. Um, and so we do that not by sticking with any one technology, but by actually continually moving on to new and better technologies. That's the history of progress. Um, and so uh, I think you know, nuclear would last us a certain amount of time. By the time the nuclear run fuel runs out, hopefully we've you know, gone on to something much, much better. We have, again, hundreds or, or thousands of years at least you know, before that happens. Yeah. Uh, probably a simple technical question, but for all of these reactors that are dependent on a source of neutrons, uh, where's that coming from and how is that controlled? Yeah, I don't remember. Um, there are sources of neutrons. Uh, there's a way to get a little like starter source, you know, that's analogous to a spark 
um, or a pilot light or whatever, right? Okay. But so then once you've got it going, uh, it's a self-sustained chain reaction. Right? Okay. And then um, unrelated, but uh, given the overall theme of future technologies and future energy sources, given the sort of social and political challenges around nuclear, uh, for good or bad, what do you think about just the future of renewables, like solar and wind and all these other things? Yeah. I don't have a very strong opinion on that. Um, uh, so the, I think, so other than nuclear, the most interesting energy sources to my mind are solar and geothermal. Um, solar, uh, and again, mainly because of sort of the density and abundance that's available, right? So like an enormous amount of solar energy hits the planet. It's orders of magnitude beyond what we use right now. Um, so we could tap a very small percentage of it and, and, and get an enormous amount of energy. Um, you know, it has its challenges. Uh, it's um, it, not all of it reaches the ground. It has intermittency, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. But um, the good news about solar right now is that the costs are very rapidly coming down. So solar panels are getting better and they're getting cheaper. Batteries are also getting cheaper. Um, so I think there will be some role for, for solar in the future. Uh, it's very, um, you know, it's very geography dependent, right? So. Um, maybe it makes more sense for, uh, for Texas to have solar than, say, the United Kingdom, just in terms of, um, you know, kind of when they, when they get the energy and how much they get and the intermittency and so forth. Um, geothermal is a, a really interesting one because with current drilling technology, uh, you can, so, okay, just to back up a little bit, um, to date, geothermal energy has mostly been taken from sources near the ground where heat is coming right up to the ground. Uh, but it turns out you can get heat, uh, heat from the earth anywhere as long as you drill deep enough. And uh, the, the oil and gas industry now has really excellent technologies for drilling very deep. And so you just drill a deep enough hole anywhere and you get to a source of heat, um, and then you bring that heat up and now you've got a heat differential that you can extract energy from. Um, and that is a very promising as, um, as a, a, you know, a totally clean energy source. Um, it's still early and it's still developing, but uh, you know, I think that has potential for the future as well. So, okay, thank you. Yeah. I grew up in a small town where the main, well, main, one of the major employers was the nuclear power plant. And uh, most people living there had a positive view of nuclear energy because it was the major employer and we didn't have accidents or problems. Um, why do you think nuclear is so vilified in the pop popular mind? Like, why are people so afraid of it? Yeah. I mean, look, radiation is scary, right? And to some extent, legitimately so, right? Radiation is harmful to human health if you come into contact with it. Um, it's invisible. <laughs> it, it can't be detected, you know, by any normal means. We don't, we can't see it, we can't feel it, we can't smell it. Um, people don't, so people don't know when it's there. Um, they don't know how much of it is around. They don't have a good sense. Even if you told them that's 10 millisieverts, right? Most people don't know what that means and don't have a way of, um, of judging. Um, and then, like I said, you know, nuclear made its introduction to the world as a weapon. And so from the very beginning, I think it was linked in the public mind with death and destruction. Um, and so, uh, you know, these things, these ideas get out there and they become very entrenched. Um, I, I don't know what else to say, you know, beyond that. I just, I don't have any tumors. I don't know anybody, you know, like there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of power plants that still function and there's not really examples. So I just find it interesting. Yeah, sure. Fukushima and Chernobyl. Yeah, sure. And Three Mile Island, right? How many people died of Fukushima? Um, because from radiation? Died. Yeah, so a number of people died from the evacuation. Uh, there is a debate about how many people died from the radiation. The answer is either zero or one. That's the people who went to West Campus is more dangerous. <laughs> Sorry, what? The people who were working on site like to try to clean up and prevent it from getting worse. I think there's some health issues that came out of that. Pretty sure. I don't know. The, the estimates I've seen are all that, I mean, essentially nobody died from radiation. Chernobyl, though, was very different. Chernobyl was a true nuclear disaster, right? Um, and part of that came from... <laughs> you watched no. this show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. So, so, so I like the video. You watched the show. It's 
if you didn't see, yeah, so if you didn't see the series, the, what was it on HBO or something, the Chernobyl series, I recommend it, very well done. Uh, haunting, really chilling. Um, it's a really funny litmus test, you know, because of course, um, all the, the environmentalists look at that and they say, wow, how terrible nuclear power is. And the libertarians look at it and they're like, wow, how terrible communism is, <laughs> <laughs> right? So uh, it's just like a, it's a, it's a Rorschach test, right? It's, so it's what you see in it. Um, but, you know, so the thing about Chernobyl is they used a really awful plant design um, that was really unsafe. And so we should never use anything like that. The U.S. never used anything like that. Um, that's why when the U.S. had actually its a nuclear accident earlier at Three Mile Island, there were no deaths um, from that one. Um, so I, I cut this from the talk because it was getting long. But so a traditional um, nuclear reactor, uh, part of the way to achieve stability is through negative, what are known in engineering as negative feedback loops. So uh, one of these loops is, for instance, as the fuel and the moderator and everything get hotter, the reactivity goes down, right? So their ability to sustain fu fu uh, fusion, sorry, fission uh, goes down. And that means uh, you've got a negative cycle where if, if the reactivity, if the fission ramps up, the temperature ramps up, that causes the fission to ramp down and the temperature to ramp down, and so it, it keeps it stable. Um, another one is, so think about what would happen if, the, if something went wrong with keeping the water pressurized and it started boiling away. Right? Well, remember the water is also, the, so the water is the coolant, so that's bad if the coolant is going away because it can, it can cause a meltdown if, it's, if you're not taking heat away from the reactor core. But remember that the water is also the moderator. So if the coolant starts going away, the moderator starts going away because it's the same substance. And that means the neutrons are not getting slow, slowed down and that means the reactivity goes down. Um, and so that is a negative feedback loop. And that is what Chernobyl, uh, that latter one is, is, is in particular is what Chernobyl did not have. Um, it had, uh, I believe, the opposite, where if the, if the moderator goes away, then the reactivity actually, um, uh, sorry, if the coolant goes away, then the reactivity actually um, increases. So, um, look, every technology is hazardous. You know, some more, some less. But ultimately, we deal with the hazards of technology through engineering. Um, and uh, we can deal with them. They're not... Uh, they're not mystical, they're not magical, they're not something that cannot be beat by sustained, uh, you know, the application of intelligence. And that's ultimately what we have to do with nuclear if we're going to use it. Hi. So I came in pretty sympathetic and optimistic about nuclear, but then I saw that graph where nuclear was really much, much more expensive than solar and some other renewables maybe, and then got me thinking, so you're, you're saying there's a learning curve and everything, but even if I buy the thesis that we missed the curve and it's, isn't it too late now? Hasn't solar become so much cheaper that we should just focus on that? Because if there's a learning curve for solar as well, it'll also become even cheaper. And it's, it just like, can nuclear even catch up to solar right now? Is what I'm thinking. Yeah. Look, for short term, for very short term energy needs, I don't have a strong opinion. Like in the next decade or two, you know, if, if, if that's, if that's what you're sort of concentrated on, um, and a lot of people are concentrated right now on the problem of how do we decarbonize the current economy, right? So without growing per capita um, energy usage and in the near term, you know, how do we just switch to, to non-carbon sources? Um, I don't have a strong opinion about that. I do think that, um, and, and I gotta admit, like, so I'm very optimistic about the technological potential of nuclear. I'm not very optimistic about the political situation. The political situation is pretty bad. Um, and so if you were saying, uh, Jason, I'm going to be a, new, a founder or an investor, and, I went, and where should I put my energy, right? Where should I put my, um, my blood, sweat, and tears into building something? Should I go up against this nuclear, um, you know, should I, should I go to, to, to war for nuclear? <sighs> you know, I mean, like, I'm glad there are some people doing that. Um, and I'm, I'm rooting for them, but like, I couldn't necessarily tell you, yes, you should absolutely invest in this. If you looked at it and you said, oh my God, this political situation is hopeless, I don't wanna deal with that, I could not blame you. Um, you know, what I wanted to do in this talk and where I focus in my work is on something just a little bit more fundamental and long term, which is how do we regard the potential for this technology? And so when you say, well, like, you know, could nuclear ever catch up? Why not just use solar? Like, they're very different technologies. Um, they're, they're useful for very different things, right? You couldn't have a solar powered cargo ship. Um, you're not going to have solar-powered space exploration, right? If we're going to if we're going to colonize Mars and settle the solar system and one day the galaxy, right? Like we're going to need different um, energy sources. So I just think that there's there's no energy source, there's no technology 
that deserves to be cut off when it has so much just potential from fundamental physics, right? We've got just this amazing area of physics that we have not exploited or have, have exploited only very little, um, far, far short of its actual potential. And I just want people to recognize that potential and like see what we could do with it. Um, so this is not meant to be anti-solar. It's not meant to be anti any other form of energy. Like in general, I'm a pluralist when it comes to not only energy technology, but, but all sorts of technologies. Like, um, you know, uh, we still use, uh, it, it's very rare that any technology is like actually completely obsoleted. Um, you know, I mentioned the, uh, the problems with open flames, but you know, we still barbecue and grill over an open flame sometimes, right? Um, we still ride horses for fun. We still listen to vinyl records. Um, you know, we, like there's lots of old technologies that we still use. Um, uh, we stopped making fax machines. We stopped making, did we? Actually, I, no, there's gotta be still fax machines. We still have mainframes, right? Um, but yeah, okay, we mostly stopped fax machines. But um, you know, in general, I think new technologies come along and they, they find their optimal uses and the other technologies can have their optimal uses and it's great, we optimize across the whole spectrum. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, I think you may have just answered my question, but I was wondering if you were aware of any you know, tangible near-term reforms to, I forget the regulator, uh, whatever you called it. Um, regulatory environment, yeah. And, and then also, if you are aware of any of the, of the newer designs, so like the thorium reactor or the molten salt um, that had gone through, uh, if they'd had any designs approved and like what the landscape looked like in maybe like the next five to 10 years. Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, I'll answer the last part of that first. So in terms of new designs, New Scale, the one that I mentioned is like the first, I think, I think the first ever advanced reactor designed to get approved by NRC. Um, like literally since the, I believe since the NRC was created in the mid 1970s, there have been literally like zero power plants built by any design that it has ever approved. Um, so now uh, New Scale got one of the first advanced reactor designs approved just, I think, late last year. Um, Aklo, one of the companies that I mentioned, has submitted their design application and it has been accepted for review. But it's probably gonna be years, um, right? Uh, Aklo thinks that they can do it faster and cheaper than others have. And again, I'm rooting for them, but I'm not optimistic. So, you know, time will tell. Um, in terms of regulatory reform, so Congress passed a law called NEMA in, I think, 2019, uh, the Nuclear Energy Industry Modernization Act that basically told the NRC to make new regulations for the, to streamline the process of approving advanced reactor designs. And so the NRC is going through a rulemaking process right now that is scheduled to land in, I think, 2024. Um, I, don't, I, have, I don't know much about it, but from what I've heard, it's not going well. Like, um, and I can point you to a Twitter thread on this, but uh, basically it looks as if, you know, we're getting a new set of regulations, but the idea of these advanced reactor designs is that by having better technology and more of these passive safety mechanisms and, and so forth and other things built in, you know, higher levels of safety engineered in, that you could streamline the review process and just, and not have it be as intensive as for the older, you know, more risky designs. And that's basically just not happening. Um, uh, safety is this ratchet that is, it goes in one direction and it's very hard to get it to go in the opposite direction. Uh, and the mentality in the nuclear regulatory world for a very long time has just been, the incentives and the pressures are all in, okay, think about this. Um, the NRC gets no credit for building the nuclear industry, right? When nuclear plants go online, nobody says, hey, great job NRC, you know, approving that, right? But what happens if anything goes wrong, right? Who gets the blame? They're gonna get the blame if they approve something that goes wrong. Um, meanwhile, when progress stalls and is stagnated, that is invisible, so they don't get the blame for that. So all of their incentives are in one direction, essentially, right? Um, so we have this lopsided incentive structure, uh, and then on top of this, of course, you've got the, um, the bit where they're paying for, you know, by the, by the hour, the review hour, so that's just another incentive to sort of string along the review process as long as it can possibly go, um, uh, et cetera, and so forth. So, um, there's this whole mentality that needs to be fundamentally changed and I don't see it changing. I think if you wanted to really attack this problem, so here's another bit I had to cut. So if anybody is ambitious and wants to go out there and devote I don't know how many uh, years of your life to, uh, to trying to improve nuclear regulation in the US, I think the thing to go after is ALARA. 
um, that, that idea of as low as, as reasonably achievable. Uh, I would recommend, uh, so there's a podcast called Titans of Nuclear, and there was a really interesting interview on this podcast with the uh, president of the American Nuclear uh, Society, ANS, uh, Mary Lou dunzik Guger, I think is her name, and she had this really interesting bit where um, she was saying, okay, so here's what happens when I go try to dig into, like, why do we have these regulations? Well, I'll go to the power plant and I'll say, why are you guys driving your radiation levels down, you know, below any sort of reasonable threshold, um, below even what background radiation levels are in some countries and, and, and so on? And the power plant says, well, the, uh, you know, the international standards body, INPO, uh, gives us credit for doing this or rates us on how well we do this. So then she goes to INPO and says, okay, why are we doing this? Well, they point the finger at, um, you know, a different body that's setting, I forget what it's called, that's setting standards for, you know, radiation health. And they point the finger at somebody else and they point the finger. So ultimately, everybody's just sort of pointing the fingers in a circle. And so she said, maybe we just get everybody in a room at once and say, hey guys, so we all agree that maybe this, we don't need to do it this way. Can we stop pointing the finger in a circle and just all agree to, you know, to change this at once? I kind of think that's what it would take. Um, you'd have to go around and build a coalition of people who, who want to get this changed, but aren't willing to stick their neck out and say this needs to change. And then you kind of get them to all realize um, you need a, 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 if you're familiar with the work on preference falsification, you need a, a preference cascade. Um, you just need to get them to all sort of look at each other and say, okay, we're all going to come out and say at once, like, yes, this needs to change. Um, and then maybe you could get it done. But I think that's a huge effort. I hope somebody does it. Um, if that doesn't happen, maybe it'll happen internationally. So um, Thorcon, for instance, is uh, abandoned the U.S. market and is building right now in Indonesia, um, who seems to be more willing to do a deal. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so Peter Thiel's mentioned there's a lot of progress in the world of bits and not a lot in the world of atoms, and nuclear is obviously in the world of atoms, uh, but it doesn't seem to be unique to nuclear. We, we can't build a lot of stuff. So why do you think that is, and, and do you think that will change anytime soon? Yeah. Uh, so this is the general stagnation idea, um, stagnation hypothesis, that basically technological progress at the frontier has slowed down from its peak around a hundred or, or more years ago. Um, I, think it's, I think it's basically right. Um, progress has rocketed ahead in some areas like computing and information, communication technologies, but it has lagged behind in areas like manufacturing, construction, transportation, and energy. Um, we're still you know, building things in factories in you know, a very similar way. Um, our, our jet planes actually fly a little bit slower now than they did in the 1960s. We had Concorde for a little, bit, for a little while and then it was grounded. Only now are we starting to see the potential of a, a supersonic renaissance uh, with companies like Boom uh, Supersonic. So um, yeah, I do think this is a real phenomenon. What caused it? I have three top hypotheses, not mutually exclusive. Um, uh, so one is, so very similar to the nuclear story, there are stories of the overreach and overburden of regulation in a number of different industries. This is not always what it is, but it's not just nuclear. Um, for instance, if you dig into, why can't we just build stuff? Forget about even technological process. Why can't we build homes and, uh, and transit, right? And uh, any kind of infrastructure. There's all sorts of, um, you know, there's all sorts of stuff where it's just difficult to build. There's a good article in Vox by uh, a writer named Jerusalem Demsus. You can look at, it was titled something like, Why Can't We Build Anymore? And um, you dig into it and a lot of it is like, we have these laws on the books that make it very easy for anybody who wants to object to a project to slow it down and hold it up. And so you get a lot of this, uh, some of this comes from NEPA, the National Environmental Protection Act from 1971, I think it was. Um, there's a lot of environmental review. There's a lot of uh, these sort of community hearings and so forth. And these can just hold up, you know, these projects for a very long time and arguably don't actually create, um, you know, that much benefit or even environmental protection. Um, so regulation is one hypothesis. Um, another hypothesis is when you look at fundamental progress in science and research. Since World War II, we've had um, uh, an increasing consolidation of research funding in a small number of kind of monolithic government agencies. And so there's been this centralization and bureaucratization of the science funding apparatus, whereas previously it was a little more uh, decentralized and there was just sort of less overall bureaucracy to it. Um, and so arguably that's causing stagnation in, um, in both in basic and applied research. 
And then most fundamentally, I think, is simply um, people's kind of fundamental cultural and philosophic attitudes towards progress as such. In the late 19th century, progress was the watchword of the day. Um, inventors like Thomas Edison were popular heroes. People saw technology and industry as just like fundamentally making the world better, making their lives better. They could see it happening. Uh, you know, the telephone and radio and uh, electricity and the internal combustion engine and um, new vaccines and then antibiotics and all this stuff was getting invented in a very short period of time. Um, and then something happened in the 20th century. And my hypothesis is that the big turning point was the world wars. Um, the world wars were a huge blow to, uh, to optimism and to people who believed in progress, especially if people believed that um, moral progress was advancing hand in hand with technological progress. It seemed like that might be happening in the 19th century. Um, democracy was advancing, monarchy was tumbling, slavery was ended in the West. Uh, people thought that the growth of industry and the expansion of trade was gonna lead to a new era of world peace. Um, I'm just reading a book right now on the history of the telegraph. It's called The Victorian Internet. And people waxed poetic about how the telegraph was going to connect all of the peoples of the world and we've been separated and now a man will love his fellow man and we will be connected to our brethren and we won't be you know, so alienated from, uh, and this will surely lead to an era of world peace. And they're writing this you know, right in the, in the late 1800s. And obviously it didn't happen. And so the world wars proved that you know, techno technological progress and moral progress are decoupled. They don't happen in lockstep. And, um, and so that was a big uh, blow. And, and uh, like a number of other concerns were coming to the fore around the same time. The environment, um, yeah, poverty and social justice and inequality and, and so on and so forth. Um, and so it just led to this, uh, to this sort of backlash against progress that really took center stage. And I think in the generation from you know, the end of the World Wars to about 1970, right, the, the, where the environmentalist movement was really taking off, I think you got this, um, this progress backlash, this kind of romantic reactionary movement uh, and, and based on a deep distrust of technology and industry. And a lot of that still lingers on and um, I, I think is a root cause of a lot of this. So the second part of that question is, how do we get back then? What do you think is the yeah. best um, path forward? Well, we need regulatory reform. We need, I think, new mechanisms of science funding. And ultimately, um, we need a new philosophy of progress. And that's what I've dedicated myself and my organization to. Uh, the mission of, of my nonprofit, The Roots of Progress, is to create a new philosophy of progress for the 21st century. Um, so I think we can't go back to the sort of naive optimism of the 19th century. There were actually you know, real risks and dangers and hazards that they weren't aware of. And we were maybe a little blithely kind of, you know, it was a little sort of damn the torpedoes full speed ahead um, uh, kind of attitude. Um, we need to get a little more careful, but we shouldn't throw the baby out with bathwater, right? We shouldn't turn against progress itself. I think that is a long-term effort of education and cultural change. Um, it'll happen over a generation or more. Uh, so it is the work of decades. Uh, but I think it begins with history. And so that's why a lot of what I do is I just tell the story of progress, the story of industrial civilization, the history of how it was created, what we had beforehand, and the problems uh, that were solved that today we take for granted because we're not even aware of how people used to live. So. Thanks. All right, back to talk about waste. Convince me okay. that you've got that nuclear has it solved. Like, I really, I'm concerned that the way that we've proliferated it, um, currently it's 10,000 years for it to, uh, you know, get to a, a level of like the standard uranium, you know, if you just pick it up off the ground, that whole, holding it safely. Uh, now with the newer technologies, I think you can get that, that down to about a thousand years. And if you're doing this in, you know, like, oh, now we're gonna just like go put it in our car and like everybody's cars are gonna be powered. I mean, that's a lot of waste that still has a long life that you have to be concerned about. Like, how are you going to like comprehensively address that so that you don't have any safety concerns with that? Yeah. Um, look, I'm not gonna be able to give you a knockdown engineering answer. Like, I'm not a nuclear engineer. I'm not gonna be able to say like, here's exactly what we do to the waste and here's exactly how it's gonna be fine. Um, but it is an engineering problem. Uh, we handle toxic substances all the time. Nuclear waste is not the only toxic substance that we, that we work with in industrial processes. Um, and in fact, most of our toxic substances do not get less toxic over time. Um, 
So, nuclear, so radioactive waste actually has this nice property that it doesn't stay radioactive forever, right? It has this exponential um, Only dampening. 10,000, 1,000 years. I yeah, think. yeah so no, that's true. Concerning. Um, but I mean, again, there's so little waste created per unit of energy that, um, I mean, you can spend a lot of resources on each unit of waste. Uh, okay, so here, <laughs> here's the thing about nuclear waste in the United States. By law, the only long-term storage for nuclear waste is at Yucca Mountain, this um, you know, spot in Nevada where there's supposed to be a long-term waste repository. Well, that repository has never been built, um, and it doesn't look like it is ever going to be built, right? What are all of our nuclear plants doing with the waste? They all remain on site. They, they remain on site, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's so little of it that they literally don't yet need another place to put it. Um, and you so, talk about interim facilities two of which have been proposed, one in New Mexico and one in Texas, and what did Texas do? It's the ultimate NIMBY issue. We've yeah, totally. said that we can't even, we're not even gonna pursue that. We're not gonna allow that to even be developed. Yeah, so, exactly. I mean, I didn't even get into this, thing. but this is another huge part of sort of like the political yes. you know, issues yeah. around nuclear. Um, but I mean, the other thing I wanna say is like, again, we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't think about technology or society as static. In much less than a thousand, I mean, look, a thousand years ago, right, we were, I don't think we even had the plow, um, right? We had oxen pulling a, a, a scratch plow or an ard through the fields to make a little furrow, right, that didn't even turn over the soil. Um, I don't think we had the spinning wheel, right? Um, so less than, much less than a thousand years from now, and by the way, you know, progress is actually a super exponential curve, so it actually, the pace of progress actually gets faster over time. Um, much less than a thousand years from now, if we can keep progress going, we will have much, much better technology to deal with the waste. Maybe we'll have nanotechnology that can, you know, that can process it at the atomic level. Maybe we'll have left Earth entirely and we'll be able to, you know, put it somewhere in the solar system or throw it into the sun or who knows what, right? Um, so I just, when people think about, oh no, 10,000 years, they think as if we're gonna have to like, keep watch over the mountain for 10,000 years. Um, and I just think that if you, that's a very static vision of, of the world. And I think that um, we, don't, we don't have to be static that way. We can, so, so very ironically, um, I'm gonna say something that is maybe very unpopular. We can leave this problem to future generations. That is a totally legitimate thing to do because future generations ought to be way smarter uh, and way wealthier than we are with a lot more science, technology, and infrastructure. They will be way better equipped to deal with it. Yeah, I don't know if that's necessarily how I feel about it. I have a lot of optimism, but I think this is the key Achilles heel that needs to be not just kind of glossed over. I think it's something that needs to be kept, you know. It's a real engineering problem. Yeah, I absolutely acknowledge sure. that. Thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, thank you. Um, about technologies used in nuclear industry, you said um, those technologies are not as advanced as computer industries. So what do you think is necessary to make progress on the technology perspective in nuclear industry? Or why, can, why we cannot make advanced or yeah, um, so what is necessary to make technological progress in the nuclear industry? Um, I mean, there needs to be a market for it, fundamentally. If there were a market for nuclear technology, then there would be companies and investment entering the space and we would get the progress, ultimately. Um, like, more concretely, um, there needs to be enough of market and uh, enough of uh, ability from the regulatory side to do faster iteration, right? So that we can have engineering cycles that are faster than decades. Um, I mentioned uh, Radiant is doing a microreactor. Uh, Oclo, one of the other companies I mentioned, is also working on a microreactor. It's about, you know, it's, it's megawatt rather than gigawatt um, size. Uh, part of their strategy in doing this is that by building very small plants, they can iterate through the engineering uh, improvement cycles much faster, and uh, that they can uh, they can learn faster and improve their design faster. So that's one approach: is to make micro reactors such that we can do better iteration. Again, maybe there will be another country um, that provides a better platform. Maybe it'll be Indonesia. Um, China just announced that they're planning a whole bunch of nuclear capacity. Um, so maybe it'll happen in China. Um, 
But I think those are, you know, that's sort of fundamentally what we need. Mm -hmm. Okay. And another question is about small module reactor. Yeah. Uh, many companies or institutes are now working on development for nuclear small module reactor. What do you think about that? And ITER is also actively working on nuclear fusion system. So what do you think about those new age systems? I'm sorry, think about the... So those uh, small module reactor or ITER's activities. Yeah, sure. Okay, so first small modular reactors. I mean, um, again, I'm not a nuclear engineer, but the concept makes a lot of sense. Um, so again, part of the enormous costs in nuclear come from these bespoke projects where everything is designed custom for one site. Um, if you wanna drive down the costs of things, uh, one way to do it is to standardize and to just you know make a standard design and then churn that out over and over. And so that's the idea with small modular reactors is we make a part that um, can be created in a factory. We can use all of the economies of scale for mass manufacturing and all of the mass manufacturing techniques to drive down the cost. Um, and then again, there's also transportation costs. So if we make it small enough that it fits in a shipping container um, or can be transported on a truck, then you know, your, your shipping costs go down. And um, so all of that stuff just like makes fundamental sense from a strategy perspective. Uh, and to my knowledge, I mean, most if not all of the advanced projects are sort of being done along these lines. It seems like a kind of best practice at this point. Now, the other thing you asked about was at the other end of the spectrum, which is um, uh, ITER and their, the fusion experiments. I don't know a lot about fusion. Um, by all accounts, it will be even better than any fission, and we'll just sort of we'll, we'll just we'll just dominate. It's even more dense. Um, you can you can fusion water basically, so the fuel is just everywhere. Um, it's really hard to get working because you need to create enormous temperatures um, in a very small space and confine it. So uh, right now there are a couple of projects going on, but. They are very large, highly funded projects with very long timescales, like decades out. Um, so again, I kind of think that what we need is like more decentralization. I would like to see 10 times as many experiments in fusion, even if they had one tenth the budget each, uh, because I think just by getting, you know, more different approaches and more different teams working on it, we're more likely to get something faster. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a question on the um, chart you had up at one point of the prices per unit energy of different, you know, uh, coal, gas, nuclear, uh, solar, et cetera. Um, so one criticism I've seen of, of solar and wind and some of the other, and some other, you know, uh, renewable energies, um, but primarily those two, is that the prices per unit of energy don't reflect what they would be if one had a grid where they were the primary power supplier. That is, this is how much it costs to create a marginal unit of power when they're working well, but if you had to factor in the redundancies required to keep their big power even when the sun wasn't shining, uh, it goes up higher. So. Um, to what extent do those figures reflect factoring in those redundancies? What solutions might there be in mind? And if one brings those issues into the calculation, how does the kind of cost trajectory curve of nuclear versus solar look? Going back to our earlier question on, on that curve. Yeah, so it's true. So when you look at those cost numbers, they are cost per like peak capacity. Um, you don't always get peak capacity from intermittent sources. So if you were gonna get, if you were going to get all of your energy from solar, let's say, first you would need to overbuild capacity by multiples, I believe. Um, so your peak capacity would have to be multiples of sort of what the average um, is gonna be. And then you need somewhere to store it, which means you need batteries right now. Um, there are also, there are pump storage systems, but you need the right geography for that. So if you're gonna do it for the world, you need a lot of batteries. Um, and so this gets very expensive. So no, the costs that you're looking at do not include the overbuilding of capacity and they don't include the batteries. Um, if you included all those things right now, uh, it would not be very economical to use, say, you know, solar for all of our power needs. Um, however, the costs in those things are coming down rapidly. And if they could hit a certain point where it would actually work. Um, I don't know if there are any other issues you would hit at that scale. 
Um, uh, I mean, at some point you're gonna you're gonna run out of just like land area, um, but I don't think you would necessarily run out of that before you hit like current world um, energy usage. If you wanna now, if you're thinking ahead and you say, look, we need ten times as much energy, a hundred times as much energy, yeah, at a certain point it's not gonna scale. Um, so uh, yeah, it does make it does make um, solar and other related technologies. Um, less cost competitive if you have to factor in all those other things. Um, but there's a chance that the cost of the underlying technologies will come down far enough in the future that it would still make them competitive. They're not there yet. Quick question on the human capital needed to advance the technology here. It seems that's a field that I don't hear a lot of smart kids around UT saying, you know what, I'm gonna be a nuclear, energy, uh, a nuclear engineer. Um, so, Maybe because there's not enough jobs there, so the smart guys are not going there, and therefore, you know, we don't have the human capital to develop this further. What is the picture on the on the availability of talent to really develop this industry forward right now? Yeah. So I think this is a real issue in that, um, you know, after all these problems that I talked about, all these all these political and, and industry problems going on for more than a generation now, the problems have kind of metastasized to the entire industry. Um, and I do think that um, investors are burned and uh, the engineers are demoralized. I do think a lot of people have sort of gone out of the field. Um, so uh, it seems to me that it's a real issue. I've gotten somewhat conflicting answers on this from different nuclear entrepreneurs that I've talked to. Some of them have said, oh yeah, it's, you know, it's hard to find the talent. Others have said, oh, it's no problem to find the talent. Um, so I don't know, maybe they're doing something different. But uh, yeah, it's true. You know, nuclear engineering isn't the hot thing uh, to go into where everybody sees tons of opportunity the way, you know, computer science and uh, finance, you know, have been in recent decades. Um, and that also has been a problem. Uh, really, the only reason that there's any hope right now for a nuclear renaissance uh, is that we have a new generation of nuclear founders coming along who are motivated in part by climate change and the challenge of decarbonization, and also uh, who maybe are just young enough that they didn't get burned and scarred by the previous. <laughs> well, this happens in industries, right? You get a whole generation knocked out, but then the young people come along and they didn't hear all the, they didn't live through all the horror stories. Um, so that is sort of the chance right now for a nuclear renaissance um, from companies like Thorcon, Oclo, Radiant, um, Last Energy is another one. I mentioned X Energy, um, and there's a few more um, out there. Um, I've also heard somebody in the policy space suggest that if it doesn't happen in the next few years, that that's going to set us back for another couple of decades. Essentially, it'd just be another it'd be another generation before we get to try again. So I think you made a convincing argument that the regulatory morass that was created in the 70s and 80s and 90s was really led to the downfall of nuclear power. What I would say is, what are the lessons that other exciting industries, geothermal, biotech, et cetera, that are coming online now should look and see what did nuclear power do wrong that we should avoid? Yeah. Okay, so number one, do not introduce your technology to the world as a weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> Um, or is a pandemic that you want to have? Yeah. Or, <laughs> so, so, so hopefully, uh, what people remember about genetic engineering is that it gave us the vaccine. Um, uh, although, actually, um, actually, I hope that people take biosafety seriously um, as well, uh, because whether or not you know this virus had anything to do with any sort of you know science or, or engineering. Um, I think there's a real chance for some you know, genetically modified thing to escape from a lab in the future. Uh, and I think that should probably be taken more seriously than it's taken today. Um, that doesn't mean we put a moratorium on genetic engineering, uh, but it does mean we just we need to be more careful maybe than we're being. Um, so uh, you know, in any, any field deserves safety measures appropriate to its actual risks, right? Um, um, but yeah, I don't know. Like, I think it was, <sighs> different technologies are received by the public in very different ways. And I think part of it is due to just the inherent kind of like, what types of problems can people imagine when they think of this technology? And part of it is sort of like historically contingent of just what were the circumstances in which the technology was introduced. Um, the internet seemed pretty innocuous until the last five years or so. I think to most people, right? Um, 
you know, whereas, uh, whereas the nuclear stuff and, and maybe biological you know, engineering just immediate, you know, people can immediately think of, of, uh, of, of more harms. Um, anything having to do with health is just, um, health issues have always been scary. I mean, for all of human history. Um, and they've always had a lot of moralizing attached to them. Um, and, uh, and they've just, diseases really freak people out. Um, whether it's an infectious pandemic or something, you know, very long-term like cancer, uh, it just really freaks people out if something can happen to their own bodies. So, um, I don't know. So I think, um, so I think it's somewhat contingent. You, you ask what lessons can, can other industries learn? I mean, I think the, some of the lessons are sort of industry specific, but, uh, I do think PR matters. I think telling the story matters. Um, one of the things that Oclo did right is they created these really beautiful renderings of, of their, uh, you know, of their, of their, what their reactor is going to look like. And it's gorgeous. Um, and the sun is shining and there's plants around and, you know, everything's really great. So, um, you know, not everybody pays a lot of attention to, um, to, to image and uh, probably more founders need to do that. I'm impressed that there hasn't been more of a pushback against self-driving cars. Um, Depending on how you think about it, you know, that could either be great for safety or terrible for safety, right? Uh, if they go, if, if they don't work, it'll be terrible. If they work really well, it'll be great, right? Uh, I think one day we're gonna look back and maybe, you know, we'll tell our grandchildren uh, that there was, a, there was a time when people drove the cars. And, right, I mean, I can just imagine my grandchild saying like, oh wow, but like, you know, how did you avoid crashes? I'll be saying, well, we didn't. There were lots of crashes all the time, right? Um, and it'll just be mind blowing to future generations, I think, right? That like that so that it was one of the you know that it was one of the top ten or twenty causes of death. I forget you know where it is, but it but it but it ranks up there. It's certainly the number one cause of accidents. Um, but somehow, um, I mean, the self driving car efforts that have been out there have I think really embraced the need to um, take safety very seriously and uh, show the public that they are doing so, right? Um, so like when we invented cars, we just put them out on the street, but <laughs> right. Um, but now that we're inventing self-driving cars, they've got to go through millions and millions of, of hours of driving and training and learning and be extremely, um, you know, extremely well trained uh, in, in simulation and, and so forth. Uh, and with human drivers behind the wheel ready to take over and, and so on. So like an enormous amount of investment has gone into this. And I think that's basically the right thing. Um, and so I hope that one turns out well. Question, suggestion that's coming out of your last answer. You said the particular thing to target was that acronym, which I can't Alara, remember. Alara, yes. Alara. Um, and it's seeming like one thing that industries can do in taking safety seriously is to think seriously about what safety standards would be from the beginning. So, for example, for cars, here's how many accidents there are per year. What a good safety standard for self-driving cars is that if most cars are self-driving, there are fewer accidents than there are now, not that there are none. And um, what would be a, a similar standard would have been for nuclear energy, you know, it's safer than coal or whatever. What, what would, metrics would there be for that and how could it be measured? And maybe a lesson to be learned and maybe that is being learned by the self-driving industry is to find a way to quantify what gains you're going to make to safety and what would be the thresholds of your own performance that would show that you're position to do that? Yep. Folks, this is like the best question period ever because you've hit on almost everything that I had to cut from the talk. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Um, Does anyone know what else he cut? <laughs> this might be the last thing. Okay, so um, yes. So first off, uh, okay. So the challenge here is that underlying Alara is a theory of radiation damage um, known as the linear no threshold model or LNT. And um, essentially, so linear no threshold says two things. So one, there's no threshold as in there is no safe dose of radiation. Any dose above zero is a potential health impact. And second, it says that the potential health, health impact like the, the cancer risk is uh, linearly proportional to the dose, um, you know, all the way down to zero. 
um, with no uh, provision for sort of like, you know, how dilute does this become and for, with no provision for how spread out is this over time, right? So uh, in this model, uh, you know, if you receive one huge burst of radiation all at once, that is exactly the same as receiving one thousandth of that dose every day for a thousand days. Um, it's also uh, the case that according to this model, if you take uh, a dose of radiation sort of delivered to one person versus taking that exact same dose and splitting it into a million pieces, each of which get delivered to a million people each, that you still have exactly the same average health impact, right? That you have like an expected one, you know, if, if, you, if you took the amount that would kill a person and then spread it out over a million people, you'd get like an expected one death out of those million. Um, as far as I can tell, this model makes no sense. It doesn't uh, comport with theory and it doesn't comport with evidence. Um, the body has processes to repair small amounts of radiation damage. Um, in particular, what happens is your DNA gets broken. Um, and, and the body, has uh, your cells have DNA repair mechanisms. Uh, and the theory is essentially that these work okay as long as you're dealing with a small number of, or a small rate of, of breaks in the, in the DNA. Uh, and when that error rate sort of, uh, or, or break rate gets too high, um, your ability to cope with it um, breaks down, and now you have cancer risk. Um, the evidence for this, you have to go through many, many studies from a number of different places. Um, and I cover this, uh, so if you look on rootsofprogress.org, I have a, a, a book review of Jack Devaney's book, Why Nuclear Power Has Been a Flop, and he goes through uh, dozens of such studies and essentially concludes that there's no measure, there's no evidence supporting any risk below a certain level. I can tell you it's 100 millisieverts um, that it's not gonna mean much to you if you don't know um, uh, nuclear technology. But, uh, you know, so that's like a certain threshold. So we could declare that as the threshold. But according to this LNT, um, you know, if you, if you had something above that threshold, um, and again, you, you know, you, you deliver uh, the, the, same, uh, you, the same dose, you know, total to you know, spread out over an enormous amount of population in a, in a very dilute quantity, that it's still going to do the same amount of harm. Um, and that just doesn't make sense when you've diluted it, you know, to the point, or when you've reduced the radiation to the point where it's well below the, the background radiation that we all get from the environment. The radiation that we're all subject to every day is not zero. Um, there's radiation from cosmic rays, there's radiation from, uh, from rocks and soil. In different places in the world, this is significantly higher than in other places. Um, country, countries like Finland, uh, there are certain beaches. Uh, I don't remember all the locations. It's all in the blog post that I mentioned. But these places have been studied and they just they don't find you know, significantly elevated cancer rates. Um, so this theory is sort of underlying Alara and is what's saying like, no, there's no safe uh, there's no safe dose, there's no threshold, and so we're not going to set a threshold, we're just going to continually drive the radiation levels lower and lower and lower. Um, now, my understanding is that if you went and talked to experts, many, or perhaps most of them, would admit that LNT is a regulatory construct masquerading as a scientific theory. Um, but again, they, it's hard to just sort of come out against it. Um, it's become a certain orthodoxy. And so I think that's another part of of how you would have to approach this is you'd have to get people to say, look, let's come up with a better model uh, that, that more accurately matches both theory and evidence um, for, for the harms done by radiation. And then we could set an actual threshold. So seeing no further queuing at the mic, uh, I'd like to close by thanking you, Jason, for this talk and for everyone else here uh, recommending that if you like um, the ideas you've heard today, there's a whole blog with tons of interesting posts uh, on many different technologies and their progress. Um, so thank you all for coming, and thanks again to our speakers.